afternoon. As usual, before we begin, I want to remind you if you're watching on Facebook, please share. And on YouTube, subscribe, like, and share. Thank you so much. Let's pray. Again, this is a part of last week's lesson. We're finishing it up. But it's so, so important because it's all about God's plan of salvation that he laid down for us by dying on the cross. We love you, Lord. We praise you. We're so thankful for your presence here right now. We're so thankful for the word that you've given, the life that you have given us with your spirit within us. We ask in your name, Jesus, that you move on each and every person. Help us, Lord. Help me to teach. Help each one of them to hear what you want them to hear. And help me to listen to that too, my Lord. I love you. I praise you. You're a mighty God. We thank you in your name. Amen. As I mentioned last week, this is, of course, Lesson 30, The Tabernacle, God's Blueprint for the New Testament Plan of Salvation. In this <clears throat> study, I will go through the tabernacle, discussing its various parts and the obedience required by the Israelites for them to obtain salvation in the Old Testament. I will also discuss how Jesus fulfilled the requirements of the Old Testament tabernacle plan to lay down the blueprint of our plan of salvation today. He did not come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. Finally, I will show God's plan of salvation for each of us today. And as I mentioned last year, I've been reading this book for 51 years now. And I have found no errors, no contradictions. I have, uh, people have told me there was errors and contradictions. I searched them out. No, there's no errors. There's no contradictions. Yeah, it's his word. And we have to look at the fact that we are going to be judged by his word. We better know it. It's going to be mighty embarrassing for some people to stand before him on judgment day and well, they had a Bible, or there was one sitting on their table in, in the middle of their living room, but they never read it. We are going to be responsible for everything in there, especially what he has done in the tabernacle by fulfilling the Old Testament plan to give us what we have today. So uh, with that, we have to remember that <coughs> salvation is not simply a mental affirmation of something. Uh, I believe in him. No. It requires obedience and evidence. Uh, anytime belief or obedience is studied in the Bible, they're always together. They require each other. If you believe, you obey. And if you obey, there's going to be evidence of that. With that, let's again get into the study. Last week, we looked at the whole tabernacle plan. We looked at the brazen um, altar, which is right here. We looked at the labor of water, which is right here. And we went over the, how they are nece necessary. Of course, there's one door. There's one way for salvation. And when you get to the door, you can stand there and look at all the things going on. and You can believe as much as you want, but until you walk in and start doing what God wanted you to do, you're not going to get anywhere. And of course, uh, Old Testament, the priest had to go in and offer sacrifices here. And when he offered the sacrifices, uh, he had to go and wash each part in the laver and come back and then uh, offer the sacrifice. The high priest had to initially be baptized in this uh, water of the labor. He had to lay down in it. It had to be big enough for that to take place. But every time after that initial baptism, he had to wash his hands and feet in the labor because blood and water had to mix. It's through baptism where we get into the bloodline of Jesus Christ. Because, uh, and <laughs> here's something fatal for some people. Some people get baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and name isn't even mentioned. No one got baptized that way in the Bible, just using titles. Everybody, they said, I baptize you in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, you've got to have that name put on you. Uh, when we are born again, we are born into his family. We have to take his name. That's the only way of getting a name on us. And for us to get into the bloodline of Jesus Christ, where we can become his bride, his children, and his church and his body. So uh, with that, I want to <coughs> start here. 
where I left off last week with the label order. I'm going to just show one slide here, and we're going to get on with the other articles of furniture. But uh, special mention of a foot directs us to the thought that it has a definite place on earth, on this earth. This is the tub or the top part. Here is the foot, and it's saying that uh, it is a type of baptism, and it has a definite place in the plans of salvation. It has a def definite place on this earth. God had them build that for a specific reason. Its main purpose exclusively to the priest was to remove that which would have disqualified for service, sin. Looking glasses, mirrors, instruments of vanity and pride provided by the women enabled them to examine themselves. The labor was made up of the looking glasses or mirrors of the women, so when you looked into it, you saw yourself as you are. And we got to get honest with ourselves, too. Um, uh, we're not really good guys. There's some old ph philosophical thoughts and man is good and no, 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 man is evil. He was born and shapen in iniquity and sin did his uh, mother conceive him. We are all filled with, uh, actually, the devil had us under his possession at one time. We all have a little bit of devil possession in us from our birth, our original birth. We've got to be born again. We've got to be born into his kingdom. The washing of the water of the word, Ephesians 5, 26, sanctifies and cleanses. Uh, John 13, 6, if I wash thee not, thou hast no part of me. And of course, every time they walked into the holy place, the priest had to wash his hands and feet. Blood and water had to mix. Every time uh, we repent, we have to look at the word of God. These two go together. We're looking at the word of God, and, and, and if he's telling us to do something, we better do it. If he's telling us to stop doing something, we better stop doing it because that could be the difference between heaven and hell for us. We're going to be judged by his word. The candlestick. Let's <coughs> take a look at this candlestick. It was not a natural light. Without it, the tabernacle would have been in darkness. Outside in the courtyard, it was... Uh, sunlight. Now in the holy place, it's the candlestick. When we get into the holy of holies where God came down in the Old Testament, it's the Shekinah glory of God that we will see there, or that the high priest saw there in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ is divine light. Without him, uh, a life is in darkness. <laughs> when he died on the cross, it was the lights went out, the sun stopped shining from 12 o'clock to 3 o'clock. It was a battle of life, light, and darkness. And he won the battle. By this light, the priest could see to eat the shoe bread and offer incense. The Bible kind of states the way it's centered, that it, it's, it's right here. The ins, uh, table of shoe bread's there, the altar of incense there, but it shone light on both of them so that when the priest came in there, high priest came in there, he could see both pieces of furniture because they were very, very important to him. Uh, the light of God had shined in our hearts to reveal unto us the mysteries of God. <coughs> the light in a golden candlestick was to be burn continually. Through Jesus Christ, we become the light of the world to burn continuously. It was made out of beaten gold. Gold represents purity. Uh, gold, <laughs> it was one block of gold, and they started beating it, and they, these branches came off of it, and you could pour oil in one of them, and in each one, the oil went up to the level where the light could be, fire could be put to it, and it was given light. Let's take a closer look here. The candlestick burned continually. The candlestick as you come in, the first thing you see is these, this candlestick burning. And uh, if the high priest entered this way, he would look to his left, and there was a candlestick. And the candlestick was giving light to everything. It was showcased in the table shoe bread, the altar of incense. Uh, the candlestick was a type of what the church was going to be. How do we know that? First of all, there was seven... Uh, uh, 
lights on it or seven lamps on it. And we look at the uh, book of Revelation, chapter 2, 3. In the book of Revelation, it talks about the seven churches. And so we see the seven churches in here. This is just uh, what God wants us to be. And of course, the basic message of the, to the seven churches was repent, repent. Five times he said, repent. So he wants us to get the sin out of his uh, our lives. The, the candlestick was made of pure gold. To get pure gold, what you have to do is you have to burn it, get the, uh, all the junk out of it, and burn it again, get it, all the impurities out of it, burn it again, get until it is pure gold. And he wants us, once we get into his church, once we are part of his kingdom, we don't stop there. That's just the beginning. That's the starting line. And at this point, <coughs> he wants us to go through a process of sanctification. First Thessalonians 4, 1 through 10. It's telling us we've got to separate ourselves from the world. He want, wants us separated people, and we've got to get the sin out of our life. We've got to stop doing some things that we're doing, and we've got to start doing some things that we're supposed to. The, looking at the candlestick here, uh, it had a bud, bow, flowers. It had nine of them, in fact. And if you uh, look at this, there is three times nine equals 27. Same thing on this side. There was 27 altogether, but there was nine bowls and bud, nine on this side. In the middle, we see 12 taken three times four, one, two, three, four. We get 12. We see here that that adds up to 66 parts. The Bible has 66 books in it. This is God showing us what he wants the church to be. The church should be a walking Bible. The church, it says pure gold and beaten, needs the ch people in the church need to get their sin out of their life. They've got to separate from the world. The world is our greatest enemy. And we each have to ask ourselves, Am I really giving myself to the world or am I giving myself to his church, his people, his mission, his purpose, his heartbeat? Olive oil beaten. This was beaten to get where it is. We've got to go through a lot of trials and tribulations in this earth. Jesus was baptized as our example and then he was sent into the wilderness for 40 days. Mark says and there was wild animals there. Uh, he had to be tried and tested. And he's telling us, you're going to go through some hardships because we've got to be tried and chest tested. He, he, he wants us to, uh, we're carrying some baggage when we come into his church and we've got to get rid of all that baggage. And there's some things that we needed to be added to our life. Uh, our character needs a, a lot of work and everybody's character. Um, remember, we were under the leadership of the devil, now we're under his leadership. So he wants to add a lot of things to our life. And by going through things, we will come out stronger if we keep looking at him when we go through the valleys. And, and when we finally get on the mountaintop, we'll be stronger. But if we don't look to him, we might have to go through that valley many, many times before he can get us to where he wants us to be. It had no base because it was symbolic of the fact that Jesus we have to totally depend on him and our life, our strength, our wisdom, our knowledge, our understanding all has to come from the Holy Spirit that's within us. It was on fire. His church should be on fire. I go into a lot of churches today and they're like they're dead. No fire at all in them. That's not God's church. He wants a church where the people are on fire, a church where people are loving others, a church where people are reaching for other people, a church that can sing with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength because they're worshiping the one true God. So important. Nine over here, nine gifts of the Spirit. Nine over here, the nine spiritual fruit. And remember, the gifts of the Spirit, a lot of people say, oh, that person operating the gifts of the Spirit, they're holy, holy, they're great, they're wonderful. The gifts of the Spirit are given without repentance, meaning you could sin and use them. If you sin and use them, woe be on to you when you face your judgment. But the spiritual fruit is what really tells a, a God, uh, tells each and every one of us 
if we're growing in him and we've got to grow in him. But remember, spiritual fruit takes a while to develop. It doesn't come up, uh, a, a, a oak tree doesn't grow up o overnight. The table of shoe bread. Oops. The priest lived upon the shoe bread. He received strength and vigor. We receive strength and grow in grace, Christ, as we eat of the bread of life. The shoe bread was to be continually renewed. The word of God must be continually be renewed in our lives. That's the word of God, 6666. Uh, it's the Bible. Frankincense was sprinkled on the 12 loaves of shoe bread. Uh, the word of God is sometimes bitter to the natural man, but sweet to the inner man. Uh, made without leaven represents sinless Jesus Christ as the word of God. This is the bread that coming down from heaven. And of course, it says when the priest had to eat the bread. They never ate it in the holy place, the area that was 10 by 10 by 20. There was another holy place, and it was right at the door of the tabernacle. Uh, that was a holy place. That's where the uh, priest just was baptized. That's where he was anointed with oil, is a typology of him receiving the Holy Ghost. And, of course, we see here that there was actually two crowns. Most tables of Shubra just have one crown, but it had two crowns. He had two crowns, a crown of thorns, and he was crowned king of kings. And there's wine here, and there is uh, incense right here. And when the priest comes into this table, he has to pick up the wine, and if he drinks it, he will die. He has to pour it out on the ground, because it represents Jesus' blood that was shed on Calvary. The altar of incense. When offering incense, the priest was shut in with God. We become lost in the spirit of prayer when we draw nigh unto him by his spirit. The fire for incense was brought from the altar of sacrifice. Our prayers must be backed up by our sacrifices. Incense was offered daily on the golden altar. Uh, we must pray without ceasing. It was made with wood, but it was overlaid with gold. And here is the altar of incense. Now we go to the final piece of furniture, and that is the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, Ark of the Covenant has two parts, the mercy seat, and you can call it a chest coffin or a coffer. A coffer is a box for valuables. The mercy seat, God's divine presence, occupied the space above the mercy seat between the two cherubim. The depth of the mercy seat had no measurements. We, we can never figure out how God can be so merciful. It's one of those mysteries we'll never figure out. Uh, the, the greatness of his love, the greatness of his mercy, the greatness of his uh, uh, grace, <laughs> and the greatness of his love. I mean, all these things, is, it's beyond measure. We can't figure it out. How can he uh, forgive us like he forgives us? The greatness of his forgiveness the Ark of the Covenant. And then we look at the fact that in the Ark <coughs> was uh, the manna, a pot of manna, the two tables of, of uh, stone that the Jesus has, or God had etched his Ten Commandments in, and Aaron's rod to butt it. They were all inside there. The uh, tablets had to be uh, small enough to fit inside the Ark of the Covenant. Of course, the mercy seat set up on top of that. <clears throat> uh, the law was the way, the manna, the truth, and the rod was the life that was within the Ark of the Covenant, the chest, the coffer, or the coffin. A new way of worship, and of course, uh, we see that in the Old Testament, they offered sacrifices. They had initially washed, this is not a correct picture of the labor, uh, and in the holy place, uh, there was the altar of incense, the table of shewbread, the candlestick, and then the Ark of the Covenant. <clears throat> uh, let me go back to this where we will stop. And
Okay, we look at this. This was the daily activity of the priest. Uh, <coughs> the priest would uh, offer sacrifices. Uh, they initially were baptized here or washed. Every time they uh, offered a sacrifice, they had to wash their hands and feet. And before they walked into the holy place, blood and water had to mix. And <coughs> in here, they would go in and the high priest would take the incense, put it upon the altar of incense. He would uh, uh, pick up the uh, wine and pour it on the ground, and then he would get out. He would go in at 9 o'clock, he'd go in at 3 o'clock. There would be two separate sacrifices, one at 9 and one at 3. And of course, once a year, he would go beyond the veil. He would go around to the Ark of the Covenant, and he would sprinkled the blood on it from the ox and the goat and that was done once a year so this was the old testament plan of salvation the new testament is the fact that at the fence we have to believe at the uh, brazen altar we have to <coughs> repent this is where we repent of our sins and the depth of our repentance equates to the closeness we're going to get to God at the Ark of the Covenant. A lot of people say this was the most important place here because that was the throne of God. But I, I said, no, I, I think this is one of the most important places because all the other things depended upon it because if the fire ever went out, then they're not even going to see God. If we don't repent before we come into his presence, the Bible says that uh, our sin can actually block our access to him. And there's not just one scripture. There's scripture after scripture after scripture that tells us that. So I regard iniquity in our heart. He will not hear us. That's just one of them. The, uh, we've got to repent. And then we have got to be born again. We've got to be baptized. Nicodemus couldn't figure it out. How are we born again? He says, marvel not what I say unto Nicodemus. You cannot see, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God until you're born of water and the Spirit, which was set up as an example for us in the Old Testament. This was the schoolmaster. Uh, the uh, Galatians talks about the fact the law was our schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. This was a step-by-step -step object lesson showing us what we needed to get back into the presence of God. When Jesus died on the cross, he took the fiery sword. When uh, he passed the veil, the veil was rent, the cherubim on it were removed. We now have access to it. And we can go boldly into his presence, but not disrespectfully. We've got to be repentant. And of course, uh, Jesus, uh, he died. He uh, washed at the labor that he died not. He was baptized. He was anointed. Um, the Bible said he was the bread of life. He was uh, offered a prayer. Uh, he was the light of the world. Uh, uh, all these, Jesus, uh, when he came, <laughs> I would state this, that in chapter 25, it starts with the ark and it goes to the outer court because when God set the tabernacle, he was coming from heaven, coming down to each and every one of us and reaching for us. But then when he was born, he turned around and he walked through the tabernacle. And of course, uh, when he died, the final atonement took place. And it did not take place there because when the temple was built, the Ark of the Covenant had been gone for uh, hundreds of years. So what he did is he went to the tabernacle in heaven. He went to the throne and he sat on the throne and he was the mercy seat he the blood his blood was set on the throne in heaven the mercy seat uh, he was the mercy seat and of course the presence of God moved to the throne room the uh, uh, and for us we've got to repent we've got to be baptized in Jesus name will receive the Holy Ghost and uh, speak in tongues. The high priest in the Old Testament, when he spoke in tongues, uh, well, when he was anointed with oil right there before it, at the door, he'd lift up the veil and he'd go in and he'd start moving. And the Bible says a golden bell and a pomegranate, and a golden bell and a pomegranate upon the hem of his garment round about. And it was upon him 
to enter into the holy place, the sound had to be heard when he went in, and that when he went out, that he died not. In this 2,000 year period, the Holy Ghost was given, and there was going to be speaking in tongues. 25 times in the New Testament talks about speaking in tongues. It says, they that believe will speak in tongues. The last one says, forbid not. People get the gifts of the uh, uh, Spirit mixed up with the initial evidence. Everybody has got to receive the Holy Ghost and speak in tongues. Read the Bible yourself. Don't take opinion of people in the church. And if you read it in the Bible, and it's all over the New Testament, you will be seeking the Holy Ghost, and you will be seeking that evidence of speaking in tongues because you want the real thing. You want to make it happen. Thank you, Lord, for your presence, for being with us. In your name, touch each and every person, Lord. We love you. We praise you forever and ever. In your name, amen.